All right. So we had some breakout room questions on the table. Um, I would like to hear what was discussed in your groups. Um, one, what is the thesis? Um, two, how did colonialism lead to the binary understandings of African men and women gender roles? Um, and then three, what stood out to you most about the reading? And what are the article's implications um, for understanding gender in our modern world? So who would like to share what was discussed in their breakout rooms? Uh, we could volunteer, I could call on y'all, it's up to you. For uh, group one, uh, we, uh, I shared that for the question number one, it would be the, uh, that back then uh, they wouldn't have gender roles until the British uh, took over. Okay, I, I, I would agree with that. Thank you, Anand. Um, who else would like to share? For, for the thesis, uh, I shared that uh, gender norms are a status of the mind and they only, they depend on the culture you live within. Mm -hmm. So, can, so gender. Another way to put that, right? Um, gender norms are contextualized by culture. That's a very good call out, Luis. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one more. Um, I can say it. So sure. what stood out to us was how women had access to economic resources and powers. And um, it allowed them to be kind of like the breadwinners, and you don't usually see that in the Western culture. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, yeah. we did as a group. Yeah. Um, so it's um, it's not normal. Sorry, it's not beyond normal. It's not abnormal that women would be positioned in positions of economic power. Um, a lot of the family wealth would go through the women and things of that nature, which is vastly different from how we understand. Um, gender roles in this society. Um, just a real quick uh, preface, right? I'm gonna move through these notes fairly quickly. I don't have a lot because there's another conversation that I wanna get to um, based off of a short video clip that I'm gonna play. So bear with me if I move through this kind of quickly. Um, if you need me to slow down, please don't hesitate to ask me to do so. Um, so, and I'm just gonna kind of extract certain aspects of the article. Um, the mom tells the, art, the author, right, you know, back home, we don't have he or she. Ibo, Ibo pronouns are gender neutral. This he, she thing, it holds no meaning where we come from, she explained, right? So even the idea of, of classifying or labeling someone as he or she doesn't really apply to Ibo culture, right? Or pre-colonial Ibo culture. Um, she says that she discovered a pre-colonial society where strict sexual dualism did exist in a form. However, this was weakened by the flexible gender system of traditional evil culture and language. As Ifai explained, a major component of this gender framework was that male roles were open to certain categories of women through such practices as Nahai, male daughters, and Igba, or female husbands. She laid out how this allows certain women to occupy roles and positions, usually monopolized by men, and thereby exercise considerable power and authority over both men and women, right? So there's, there's embedded within their culture these um, exceptions, if you will, right? Or, or these outlets that allow for women to hold positions of power. One of them being, let's just say that a family that was born um, with many daughters and they don't have men to fill these certain roles, then the daughter would play the role um, that would allow for example, the wealth of the, of the family to remain within the family, the family's legacy to remain within the family. Um, I'm gonna read, I'll start here. So one of their specific duties was to see the rule, sorry, was to see that rules to safeguard or protect women against physical abuse were obeyed. For example, the ban on, the ban on sexual intercourse within a, with a nursing mother and the two year spacing of children explained Ifi, but all of this began to erode with the arrival of the British in Nigeria in the late 1800s. The idea of women as market sellers, political leaders, and successful entrepreneurs in those days were incredibly foreign to the colonizers. With their arrival, they brought a rigid, binary, and patriarchal concept of gender, which were deeply embedded into the fabric of the colonial empire. So one of the things that the article kind of touches on 
but is really worth a very deep investigation is the role of these women market sellers. And these women market sellers in Nigeria had great, great power within the society. In fact, um, I don't, a little music history. Anybody heard of Fela Ransom Kuti? Fela Kuti? So he's a very famous Nigerian, um, really the father of Afrobeats. So Afrobeat is like a really popular thing now, right? This West, Co West, West African form of music production. Um, the father of Afrobeat is his brother named, by the name of um, Fela Kuti. Um, in fact, in the Pan-African Studies Department, we have a Igbo class that we offer, which is a Nigerian language. And the professor of that class, Baba Anochi, used to play drums, I believe, for Fela, right? But why Fela is important is his mother. Um, his mother was one of these market women. And you had, you had the class, Sheree, uh, Baba Noshi's class? Yes. Um, yeah. Back a few years ago, a while ago, yes, and he has a um, a clothing store in Altadena as well. I've been there yep. and met his family and stuff. He's very nice. Yeah, he's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant brother too. Um, but Fela's mom was one of these market women, and she was very responsible for um, a lot of uh, a protests, a lot of rallies, and a lot of the movement against against colonialism in Nigeria. And they used the power of the marketplace to to do that. So a lot of market boycotts and things like that to where the goods and services that were um, quintessential to Nigeria were placed on pause because the women decided not to engage in those type of trades in order to kind of bring an awareness to the colonial situation, right? So these market women have vast power and that's something that doesn't go into depth in the article, but is, is very prevalent if you know Nigeria's history. Um, and if you do a close reading on the article, you'll see they kind of touch on that. Um, forgive me if I mispronounce this, um, it's Ifi Anadume wrote about how rioting by Igbo, Igbo women, and this is a marketplace women I was talking about, um, from 1928 to 1930, eventually led to the collapse of the warrant chief system of local government. There was also the Nawo Balala, the dancing women's movement of 1925, which demanded a rejection of Christianity and a return to traditional customs, right? So for me, this is speaking to the power of the women in Nigeria and how they were able to um, course correct social phenomenon and, and create ruptures in Nigerian society that would undermine colonial systems. Um, and then this idea of, of the housewife that the Europeans brought into Africa, it says that before colonization, there was no such thing as a housewife. Um, women worked incredibly hard as providers, entrepreneurs, and political actors. While nowhere near perfect, indigenous Igbo tradition gives women more freedom than the rigid Western gender construction. Yet, men in the post-independence era comfortably adopted the Western system, which, places, which placed them far above women. Even sadder are the Igbo men who continue to accept this as a fundamental cultural belief. Many remain oblivious to the fact that it's actually a major departure from the flexible Igbo gender system. So he, so what the author is arguing, right? These Igbo men who continue to ascribe to these European and these colonial ideas of gender is really the 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 um the greatest loss to Igbo culture as it pertains to how we um, how they identify and deal with gender, right? Um, and then finally, the final um, paragraph in examining sex and gender in Igbo society today, it is evident that colonialism was not just an event, right? Colonialism is a structure, an unhealed wound that remains open to this day. In the form of Western gender norms among a multitude of, I mean, excuse me, among multiple other manifestations. In examining this structure, we must not forget about the indigenous systems, the values and agencies that came before. There are many lessons to be learned in the rich history of gender and sex in African society, notably the value of considering human beings for their true authentic selves not the label society ascribes to them. So again, just placing emphasis and ownership on the individual and not the labels or not the social construction is really the, um, the value that the author wants to situate as important, as the foremost of importance. Um, so again, I kind of moved through that quickly because I want to kind of get to our other conversation. But first, I do want to do our um, fishbowl. So for those who want to volunteer, um, you have two fish bowls per semester. 
um, and you have one time to pass. Is there anyone who wants to volunteer for today's fishbowl? Me. Okay, we got Lammy. I heard two uh, Armani, Ryan. And I'll just okay, okay, give me one second. Um, do because we, we have so many. Can you put your hands up for me, please? So I, I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Yeah, LJ. We have Ryan. We have Armani. And I'm missing one more. Lizette. Okay, so I'm just going to recap, make sure I have everybody. Um, I have Lizette, I have Armani, I have Ryan, I have LJ. Is anybody missing? All right, but whoever wants to go first, it's on you. Sorry, Professor, could I also be added to that? Yeah, Alexandra, I got you. Yep. So, and Alexandra. I guess I can go first. I already have two fish bowls, but I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> Gotcha. Um, so my best friend, she's Igbo and she's, her parents are from Nigeria and all of her sisters, including her, are attorneys. And um, she said that her, you know, since they are Nigerian, they come from a very strong background of a good worth ethic um, and being independent, that this article resonated with me and just remembered how she was talking about how her parents kind of drilled her to be independent. But now that she lives in a Western culture, as she's getting older, because she's about to be 30, um, she's in this place of like, I need a husband, even though she has like this successful career. And that just made me like resonate and think back to how the Western culture has kind of affected her culture as well. Yeah, it's a good call, Armani, thank you. Who's next? Um, I just want to share a couple notes that I took out from reading. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, how has westernization and colonialism uh, shaped family and friend expectations in terms of gender? And I felt like this could be seen in names, appearances, norms, roles, and something as simple as like gender reveals and, and also the differences between sex and gender. And, um, and I, it was interesting to me how fluidity today in Western culture compared to Igbo culture and the differences of breaking the binary and giving non-binary non statuses. So do you think, um, Ryan, from how this articulated in the article to how, is, how we're articulating ideas around binary, do you think that it's a, a departure from how Igbo society articulated it versus today? Or do you think it's an uh, alignment with how Igbo society articulate, articulated it versus today? I think, um, I I feel like it's an alignment like to Igbo culture to, to of terms of being the non-binary statuses and um, and how we want to be called if you're if you don't care about the binary if you want to break the binary you know and I think that that goes um, in a connection to the ego culture more so than the Western modes of the binary system. Thank you, Ryan. Who's next? I can go next. Um, you know. Don't mind me. I got a mask when I'm in the, the office, so you know what time it is. Um, but what I wanted to share is that, um, so when I read this article, you know, the first thing I thought about was like, man, this is like a smoking gun, man. This is, this is, uh, this is groundbreaking. And the, and the reason I say that is because, um, oh yeah, I'll be there. And the reason I say that is because, um, you know, based on our rate, our upbringing and, con and, and uh, conditioning and Western ideology, you know, these things have always been like um, uh, taught to us, right? Like how, you know, men are supposed to act boys and, and, and females. So to actually read that pre-colonization and that, that people of culture, uh, I'll use the word people of culture because I'm pretty sure this, this probably applies to other indigenous cultures where the, where the woman is uplifted and they're able to, to take on roles that uh, would be assigned to to to, uh, to males or, or men, and in the reading it made sense. So you know the the part where it talks about you know the woman uh, or the or the girl being the son or taking a male responsibility, trying to land a property. Like, and I read that I said, you know, it makes sense, mm -hmm. and it, it also made me think about how um, uh, my lady, you know, she you know she she kind of so so my lady's from the south. 
and she talks about um you know being her dad they she had he had two daughters mm -hmm. and so he wanted he wanted a son and so since he didn't have a son you know he raised them like being rough as if they were men and as a result as the oldest daughter she picked up traits you know like like that were that you can attribute to like masculinity you know being tough um you know having a developing a threshold for pain physical pain which would you know kind of evolve as she got older so you know even even today you know what i'm saying like even as 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 black people in, in america's right like you know we're africans in the american diaspora we have an innate you know what i'm saying inclination to 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 to, to some of the stuff that the igbo people you know in, in terms of you know raising you know women in, in certain in certain situations to have the characteristics and also take on responsibilities that that um would be that males would, would take on um if they're present and so to me uh just reading this it was it was delighting it made sense one also key key point that stood out to me that was kind of discussed in a in a in the group uh in the group in the breakout group was there wasn't and so it wasn't like it didn't, it wasn't no mention of it being like like this was like a condition of like homosexuality you know what i mean like it was no mention that oh this is what we're doing and it, and, it, and it goes into like this whole thing with homosexuality it was tied to like the need yep. so you know the, the 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 whole gender thing with equal people was very it was very diverse and um versatile and it seemed that it was contributed to a need not not like oh you know it's like wild taboo homosexuality going on so uh, so that's that was my takeaway for me. To me, this was like a smoking gun, and so, um, and then last but not least, it just it really points out, man, we've been fucked over by colonization in so many ways. Like you can't say it enough. You can do a class. Yeah. We you can actually hold a class, like a whole probably semester, on how us people of culture have been fucked over by colonization. You know what I'm saying? Like even today, you know, we got people yelling out things. How you you know what get my attention, professors when. Any any little thing happen, people get to yelling out Jesus. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Now, I know that's a conversation for another day. Everybody wanna everybody right. wanna get to yelling out Jesus. And the first thing I'm thinking about, what Jesus? Baby Jesus? Right. You talking about the Jesus, but you know, I know that's a conversation for another day. Yeah. Thank Indeed. You. Indeed. Thank you, LJ. <laughs> um, we have uh Lizette and Alexandra. I, I didn't can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, okay. Um, so I just wanted to make that connection. Um, I right now I'm in the child development major, and we are talking about how um, children learn these stereotypes and gender their roles when they are young. And yeah, this was interesting to know because my group and I were talking about how families and the culture and the culture of the families impact the gender roles of a child. And but we never mentioned like the arrival of British who brought out this culture. Mm -hmm. Culture. Uh -huh. So we. So I think that was interesting to know like the roots of like this um, gender role uh, problem. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Alexander. Yeah. Um. Just wanted to add a little bit more to question three. You know what stood out. Um to you the most about the readings? When I first started to read it, you know, it's not that long. Um, and when they first mentioned, you know, uh, the male daughter and the, um, who was the other one called? The male daughter and female the- husband. Yes, the female husband. You know, it was a really interesting term that I, I had heard for the first time in the culture, well, in the society that I personally personally grew up in, you know, there's not such a thing as a daughter taking over the duties of a son just because um, her, fa her father, her family overall didn't have enough voice to take over those um, activities. Um, so to me, that was shocking, but really interesting in a way, since uh, if we're comparing it to uh, like the pre-colonized uh, Ig Igbo people, mm -hmm. um, um, you know how it was allowed for the daughters to take over such things, you know, have how we've been talking about, you know, the uh, land things and property and um, um, trade. But if we compare that to the colonizers, the British, even if the male of the family needed sons 
um, they wouldn't have allowed for the daughters to take such roles. They would have just waited for the daughter to marry and then give all uh, what could have been given to the daughter to the like the new husband and then the legacy of the family would have uh, stayed with the new husband not with the family of the bride in a way uh, alexander can i ask you a question um what yeah. what culture are you coming from oh well i'm latina i'm from el salvador so um reading about you know the uh, uh, male daughter and the female husband it was kind of interesting to me because uh in my society, they take, you know, the pronouns she for her and, you know, he for him very seriously. Yeah, and, and I, I, I would just be curious, Alexandra, right? Like, what were the pre-colonial people of your area, of El Salvador, doing prior to European invasion, right? What were their gender dynamics? Because really what you have to think about, this wasn't a thing until Europeans set foot in Africa, right? So it's very probable that um, it may not have been the thing in El Salvador either until Europeans set foot in El Salvador, right? So I, I think what we all should be attentive to, no matter what cultural background you're stemming from, is what is the role that Europeans played in causing this interruption in the way that we do our normal everyday activities and life experiences? So you may find a lot more in common with the Igbo people um, pre-colonization in the way that the El Salvadorian people operated pre-colonization as well. There may be a lot more similarities there than you think. Um, one thing I kind of want to do is, is, is um, deal with um, Ryan's statement and then LJ's statement to kind of bring them together in conversation with one another. Um, do want to start this overall in general, right, as we go into this conversation. I'm a work in progress. I don't understand all the things like I should, right? And a lot of what we're doing now is, even for me, is working out a deeper understanding of a lot of these identities, right? And um, I'm gonna use Ryan's contention that the non-binary understanding is an, is an alignment, let me certainly say it this way, the non-binary understanding that the Igbo people have is in alignment with the non-binary understandings that we have into US society today. Um, he says that, that they're in alignment, right? And, and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong. This is what Ryan's contentions is. Um, and then LJ says that, you know, these, the malleable gender norms, right? Have nothing to do with sexuality. It's just to fill the need, right? And and I don't, and again, I don't know if this is a, 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 a two points of contention, right? And, they, and you all might be saying the same thing, but what I wanna do is kind of pray, place these two conversations on the table together and see what our conversations produce, right? So, cause, cause I, I agree with LJ in the sense that um, the way that the Igbo people are conceptualizing gender is completely separate from sexuality. Right, has nothing to do, that's not even mentioned, right? Because even though that you take on this role of, of female husband, right? You're still married to a man. So it doesn't have nothing to do with, with your sexuality, right? But in our time, in our modern time, right? Although there is a clear difference between gender and sexuality because of the, um, because of the way that people within the community of the LGBTQ plus operate, right? Oftentimes those are lumped together and those distinctions aren't really made clear. So for me, this is kind of why I was really curious and why I asked Ryan, is it in alignment or is there a, 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 a distinction being made between the way that these two things are operating? And I think for me, right? Because of, even if you think about it, you put this LGBTQ plus, right? They're all grouped together. So they're merging sexuality and gender within the phrasing of, 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 the, of the letters, right? So I'm curious, right? I'm trying to understand, for me, trying to have a deeper understanding of is that a distinction or is that in fact still in an alignment with how the Igbo people think about terms of gender? So again, this is a question that I have uh, as a personal curiosity of mine. And I'm hoping that through conversation, we could sign a little bit more light on that conversation. Anyone want to chime in or anyone have extra insight on that? Um, just to talk about pronouns, I think it's it's interesting because 
I've always never like I've been sure if I could use because I know some people use they them and some people well personally I I go by all pronouns so I, I and I think that's um it's an interesting thing because no matter what we live in a world where people are still going to call you sir and or ma'am or just like random things just based off of appearance and I think that's um interesting to talk about so I think I think some some things are still like a gray area of like terms of of gender and also um in comparison to the eco culture I, I could see that so it's not it, it's not even crystallized fully it's kind of, kind of what I'm gathering from you Brian and it's, yeah there's still areas of contestation between um these communities yes and um I think yeah I think what I was trying to dig out more into was just because I know people say they're also gender fluid and I, I felt like that was most um in connection to the ego culture and, and for me like reading it I don't know if it's like um gender fluid in the sense of um women presenting as males but this idea of women being able to fulfill the roles that are designated to men, right? And, and, and I, I would also kind of throw out there that they're only perceived as male roles, again, because of colonialism, right? So yeah. it may not have even been a, a, something that is a male role, it's just you're feeling, to LJ's point, the needs that's there. And mm -hmm. that's what's going to dictate how you're, you perform these roles, right? Ryan, you were going to say something else? Oh no, I, I agree. Okay. Because uh, I feel like there's um just that distinction of, and also connects still to the whole masculinity and femininity and what it means to be dominant in a space. And I think that Igbo culture really, like how being referred to as a he or she in like um, different settings. And that was more about the, I feel just like the the essence of the spirit of um of what, what you need to do in the given space, that what's best for the given space. Yeah, I agree. And not just in terms of the name, like of, of the pronoun. Right, yeah, I, I completely agree, Ryan. Uh, Sheree? Oh, from my understanding, um, from Ryan's point of view, when he said it, I thought it was in alignment as far as men being accepting of taking on the quote unquote woman roles like a stay-at-home dad that's very popular that wasn't popular maybe 20 years ago like but as far as like women doing more and being proud of it and accepting that um label of breadwinners that's kind of the the gist i got from like how it could possibly connect um from today's time from Igbo people because i know they're very heavy on ancestral like that's the most important rather than like you said gender roles that really isn't really their thing it's more so just being respectful to your elders and acknowledging who is you know um who has come before you and stuff like that so that's what i kind of i kind of got from ryan was that part like some some way that you know it's it's more accepting now that people are switching the the labeled roles for men and women in today's society. That's all I would say. Yeah, and, and I would add to that too, Sheree, like um, at least I can only speak to the black community, right? Because that's what my experiential experience stems from. Like there's always been a thing to where African or black women would take on quote unquote male roles because of lack of manhood, right? And to me, that's exact and in direct alignment with how the Ebos perform these roles. Um, so what I kind of want to do is pivot our conversation um, and I want to play a quick video. Um, for me, right, I'm, I'm a Pan-Africanist, and as a Pan-Africanist, I'm always looking for unity and har harmony, right? And I'm attentive to things that cause division, and I, and I tend to either critique things that cause division or try to pull away from things that cause division because I don't think it's, it's beneficial or generative for the progression of us as a people. So I want to first and foremost throw that out there before I um, um, play this video. To, I do believe as a whole, right, the what's being mentioned in this video is not reflective of the community that's purporting this information. I think this is, a, is an individual stating his individual opinion, right? So let's take that into consideration also. And then we'll have a discussion about um, what, 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 what you're gonna see. So bear with me. 
Also, if you see, so if y'all know who this is, the type of Pan-Africanism that he's talking about, we ain't all the same. It's not the same type of shit, right? I, I'm, I have a little bit more nuanced perception of Pan-Africanism if you know who this individual is. So we'll watch. What exactly do y'all stand for? What are your goals and objectives? You know what, it seems pretty bold to ask something like that, seeing as how the only thing on most straight black men's resume is audacity. Y'all are literally the least qualified out of anybody in this country to lead somebody, but y'all always want to be in the front. But you know what, it's a special place in hell for a bitch like you that causes division amongst the entire community of people. Out of every subsection of the black community, y'all are the least educated and the most incarcerated. Please tell me what qualifies you besides the dick between your legs to lead somebody into anything. Y'all always want people to breathe life into y'all, but at this point, it's just pure necromancy because we have no more life to give. Y'all suck the life out of every fucking thing. I mean, let's call the thing a thing. Y'all want to be white men so fucking bad. Y'all see white men at the heads of their household, and y'all can't even get a household to be the head of asking women questions like what do they bring to the table when you don't even own your table you rent it hell that's even if you do rent it because it's probably in your mama name i mean if we could call the thing a thing y'all are the common denominator out of every issue that we have in the black community y'all are literally the root cause blame black women for fatherless behavior but then fail to realize that the father is the person that you're not blaming y'all blame men for being gay and say yo you grew up without a father do you see how you just pointing back to the issue Y'all blame women for having too many kids as if they made them kids by themselves. You keep pointing back to the issue. I'll be wanting people to hold y'all down, but at the same time, if they too good at it, then they too independent. Then you want to say, oh, yeah, like, you don't need me. They kind of don't. Maybe what y'all should start considering is that maybe our community is meant to be matriarchal. But y'all just can't accept it because it doesn't fit into what the white man has told you to believe. You're trying to do everything that the white man does, but you're just trying to do it in black. It's literally the same shit. I mean, y'all are the most homophobic, the most misogynistic, the most transphobic, the most colorist, the most texturist, like the most xenophobic. And you are the most likely to date outside of your race. Y'all are a walking contradiction and a walking joke, and it's not funny. I always want to talk about breaking generational curses and building generational wealth, but you don't even have life insurance. Anytime you die, we got to do a damn GoFundMe. Y'all can't even die right. Y'all have been trying to stick this square peg in a round hole for centuries and it just doesn't work okay so um a lot to unpack there um but but like it's an intellectual exercise right like let's don't get, don't get caught up in the emotion of what's being said but think about what's being said as it relates to the article right um yeah for sure shots fired um and and also right again i don't believe that this sentiment and i could be wrong is reflective of that whole community. This is one individual's opinion, right, from this community. So let's discuss what y'all think. What are y'all thoughts about this? It, it like reminded me of Kanye West on the, like, he wants to bash black people one minute, then he wants to support a black people. And then on the other hand, people are feeling sorry for Kim, uh, Kim Kardashian, but it's like you knew, or maybe she assumed that she could turn um, a black man into a successful businessman and um, change his outlook on life because she surround, they're surrounded by that type of person. Yet there's broke white women, broke black women with the same kind of issue she's going through, but it's being televised and it's putting the blame on him, but it's like, it's a two way street, like, you know, something other than like not talking it out or whatever. I don't know their lives, but it's like, it kind of just reminded me of Kanye West, like how you want to be pro black, but you're not pro black for everything. It's selective when you want, when you want to be black and want people to help you out and feel sympathetic. Okay. But then when you don't, you're like bashing and not keeping it consistent. So cl for clarification, Cherie, you feel that the individual who is speaking is kind of like Kanye to where he's um, some timey in his support of Blackness, or you're saying um, that Black men are some timey in their support of, of Blackness? No, the first guy who spoke about the, who was questioning them, like, you know, a lot of authors and people that we look up to back in the 80s and the 60s, singers, jazz singers, they were gay, openly gay people that people idolize were openly gay. And it's like, it's always a problem in the black culture 
when your son is gay, but it's okay when your daughter's gay. And that's kind of what I got from that is like the guy who was um, pointing out things was feeling like um, it starts from the black father figure that was absent. And I feel like it was a lot of hurt there because it wasn't like connection. Like it was just very, it seemed like it was, it was some issues there yeah. as far as that goes. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of pain in his commentary. Um, so just so I'm making sure I'm understanding, um, the person who asked the question, Umar, right? Um, he says, what does this community, what do y'all want, right? So you're saying he is some timey in his support for blackness. Yeah, it's like you're pro-black, but you're not pro-black for everybody. Like, why are you, why are you separating them? They're a part of us. Every um, okay. So, but, but just to just kind of, let's provide some context. I don't, I don't believe in the question, it's a separation. Yes, that's Umar, Dr. Umar. So I, I don't inherently believe he's asking, what do y'all want the vibes, right? I, oh, that, okay. that's, not, that's not to me, not to yeah. me. That's not inherently divisive statement, right? Mm -hmm. um, but implicit in that, it, there is some, some of the division because he's saying that as men, you're separate from hetero men, right? But if we're gonna go down that route, so is the individual who responds. He's creating a divisive statement by yeah, saying exactly. that black mm -hmm. men, yada, 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 because by default, right, you would be considered a, a black, black man. man. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, other thoughts, other thoughts. I, I, uh, I think Alexandra said, I'm, I'm processing. I, I feel you. It's a lot to take in. I, I had to sit yeah. with like two weeks. Yeah, I was processing. I would, I would probably like to watch it again too. Um, but I think honestly, both, parties are being counterproductive um personally um it i feel like um both of them are i guess when you're looking at it from both perspectives they're symptoms of a greater problem like there's way more to go down like into the roots of what the actual problem is versus like the surface level of what so, Alexander, if, if i kind of put you on the spot not to cut you off but what do you anticipate as the the surface i'm sorry the, the the root of the problem what would you say that stems from i mean everything that we've been talking about in this class so far yeah. that's what like the black manhood and masculine like the trayvon martin article the gender article we're reading right now that's the I mean, that's all the colonialization that like, good where it's gotten us today and those are the problems but unfortunately instead you have two people arguing about the symptoms of what all these problems have caused yep and, and for me alexandra that was my takeaway um it's you're focusing on the symptoms, which are byproducts of the, the more systemic issue, which is whiteness, right? Not white people, but this idea of whiteness as being the norm. And that's really where, where we're stuck at. And this is why you have um, what they call oppression Olympics. Um, but it was by Deshaun Harris that connects the topic of anti-fatness, gender, anti-blackness, health, they're all not. Hey, um, Ryan, could you kind of um, articulate a little bit more on, on um, what you place in the chat? Yeah, it's just um, this book I've been wanting to read and check out, um, but it, he's, they're a non-binary um, um, writer, and I've heard really great things about it, and there's also an, an audio book. So it's just uh, other ways to look at um, non-binary. Yeah, of yeah, gotcha. yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. So I'm also looking at the chat. Um, yeah, it's some truth in that, right? Like, as, as a black man, right? As a, as a heteronormative black man, there's some shit that I had to eat and I had to sit with and be like, yo, he ain't wrong. And there's some things that we need to, as black men to do better. Um, first and foremost, I think as black people, period, right? You gotta get that little white man out of our heads that's directing us to, to behave in certain ways, right? And again, that's across the board, but um, definitely as black men, because once we do that, um, things like that he's critiquing us on won't be an issue. And also I don't, his critique of we're a matriarchal by nature, he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. And I don't believe that all black men have a problem with that. My pops, right? My pops for one, heteronormative black male, right? But he has no problem with my mom's running the household, right? He, he has no issue with that. And most black men, whether they admit it or not, right? That's how this household ran. Like, let's just call it what it is, man. Like, and I, I don't believe that's out of context with how we've been as a people since the beginning of time, right? Um, 
And, and, and maybe it's not a question of the running of the household. It's more of a question of doing what needs to be done for the household to be ran effectively. And I think this is really what the article is talking about. You're going to take whatever means you need to take to ensure that your family, your community, and your society is going to be maintained and operated in order, right? And if that means you stepping on a perceived role that someone from the outside says is deemed for men, fuck that, right? And this is why the article is called Fuck Your Gender, your gender Norms, right? Not our gender norms, fuck your gender norms, because you're imposing these norms on us. And when you buy into things that are placed on you from the outside, you have conversations like we just watched, right? And that's the byproduct of adopting foreign ideas and ideologies into the way that you look at life. Um, let's get one to two more comments and we'll call it a day. I just want to go back into what you said, like, um, about, like, um, wait, sorry, I lost my thought. I'll, I'll come back. Anyone else? I, I, ju I just want to add, as a, as a Black man myself, um, you know, listening to the individual talk, um, uh, he, he was, I had to eat some of the stuff as you mentioned, I, I'm sitting there listening like, yeah, it's true, unfortunately. Um, it, it's, it's some truth in what he's saying, though, is he generalized it, which is a problem. Uh, but there's some truth. And um, as um, Alexandria mentioned, uh, look, both it's a symptom of a greater problem, you know, uh, within, you know, the black community, the structure of the, of the how of the black household, like, you, you know, one thing that I've kind of marinated on in, in conversations I've had with people I know in my personal life, uh, when, when, when you know, when I talk about, you know, these type of conversations outside of school is look, you can be black and anti-black <laughs> as a black, as a black person, you can be anti-black. And, and so on both sides, it speaks to that. You know, that person is, is spewing a whole lot of anti-blackness because I, I would, I would, I would guess he's not with a black man, right? <laughs> not talking that way. He's definitely on the other side. And, um, and then for for a lot of uh, you know for for a lot of black men, um, and it's true. I've had conversations about it, man. You know, it's even in music, right? If like if they do they if if we do date black women, we 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 idolize the red bone. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They gotta be red bone and 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 and, and light skinned and all this old shit. And look, I like I like I said, I'm glad, man. I'm at a place where I'm at today that I'm not part of that that foolishness. But as as uh, Alexandra highlighted. That's a conversation for another day because that's a symptom of a greater problem. And again, I would I would present that problem is a as a byproduct of colonization, slavery, black people being taught to hate themselves, black people having to assimilate because of the mulatto race and and and, and assume a, a life of being white to make it. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's a symptom of a of a larger problem. Yep, absolutely, LJ. Thank you, Ryan. Oh, I remember my thought. So I. Uh... I just like questions that I often think about of, you know, where does homophobia come from? Where does transphobia come from? And this could all link back to uh, colonialism and even religion. <clears throat> and I think that's important to think about as well. Especially religion. Especially yes. Religion. Especially religion. And, and, I, and I, you almost can't separate colonialism from religion. But, but to me, what's interesting um, you go to the black church, right? A lot of these black churches got that one cat leading the choir, and you know he ain't. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know, you know what's up with this cat, right? Like you know whether he's into his truth or not, but you know he he's either closeted or something's going on, right? And and it's funny how that can coexist, right? As as homophobic as Christianity is, there's these um these moments where there's a confluence, right? Um, and, and you see that a lot in the black church and, and they don't talk about it, right? And, and they'll allow it to, to continue and allow, allow it to go on and they won't make a big deal out of it, but it happens. And, and I know even in my upbringing, it was like at least three separate churches that somebody either direct in the choir or somebody in the choir, you would assume that they're homosexual, right? By the way that they act and perform. Um, but, or they're battling with that truth that they're going through, right? And they're allowed to be in the church. No one in the church is mm -hmm. putting any judgment on them. Um, it's just what it is, right? 
Yeah, it's it's the people that accept you in your community too. Yeah, which is matters. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um. All right. So for next week, um, again, there's no readings that's, that's going to be assigned. Um, I will email out to you all your study guide, your midterm study guides. Um, so just kind of peruse those. Um, what we'll spend next week doing is kind of going over the study guides, getting you all prepared for your midterms. And then um, Thursday of next week, I will email the midterms out to you all. And you'll have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, all of Monday to get those complete and submitted to me along with your journals uh, via Google Classroom. So there'll be a site on, there'll be a spot, excuse me, on Google Classroom for you to submit your midterm and for you to submit your journal. Uh, but again, we'll, we're going to do a very thorough review um, leading up to that so you're all prepared. Um, and that way you can ask whatever questions you may have as well. Um, but other than that, you all be healthy, be wealthy, be wise. Um, please reach out to me if you have any questions, comments, or